Orphan Train. Today on Echoes Through Time, during the 19th century, New York served as the gateway to America for millions of immigrants fleeing crises, famines, and persecutions occurring in Europe. A city like New York met the expectations of anyone seeking a place to start a new life and build a better future for their families. It was a city in growth with significant expansion, large factories, and emerging economic activity. However, this great attraction also brought about a darker side as its population grew. So did poverty and precarity among many of its citizens. It is estimated that, in 1854, more than 35,000 children, including orphans, abandoned minors, or vagabonds from dysfunctional families, were living in destitution on its streets. A reality repeated in many other cities on the East Coast. This situation became a social problem and an uncomfortable reality for politicians and citizens alike. Orphanages could barely accommodate such a volume of children, so many of them had to live without the shelter of a home. In orphanages, they were provided with scant food, a bed, and harsh treatment with the expectation that they would leave the center by the age of 14. In 1853, a Methodist pastor named Charles Loring Brace founded the Children's Aid Society to assist indigent children with the clear aim of ending what some citizens referred to as juvenile delinquents crowding the city streets. Later, another organization, the New York Foundling Hospital, also began to fulfill the same function. These projects had governmental support, as well as support from religious organizations and business corporations. The Children's Aid Society initiated the orphan trains, which operated for over 75 years and transported more than 250,000 children from the East Coast to the Midwest, with the theory that in those areas, they could have a healthier and happier life. Other opinions suggested that corporations and politicians supported this initiative to cleanse the streets of New York of child vagabonds by sending them away. From this point on, Opinions about the activities of the Children's Aid Society have to different perspectives. One speaks of a great opportunity for these children to find a loving family and a stable home in which to be happy. On the other hand, it is now easy to find testimonies from many of these children who, as adults, spoke of their experiences and explained their reality. Many of them recount that instead of finding a kind and caring family upon arrival at their destination, after journeys that could last from three days to weeks, they became free labor for farmers and industrialists who exploited them. Few of them understood what those journeys meant. Some of these children were assigned to families beforehand, while others had to make various stops in towns in the hopes of being selected by a family. They were lined up by age in front of families waiting for them. In some cases, they were examined for their teeth, eyes, and limbs to determine if a child was strong enough for farm work or had the necessary skills and good character for cooking, cleaning, and serving in their homes. Babies and older boys were the first to be selected, in contrast, older girls were the last. They had to undergo a trial period after which they were either definitively assigned to families or returned. When this happened, the children had to continue traveling on the train, stop after stop, hoping that some family would want them. Charles Loring Brace argued that hard work, education, firm and compassionate upbringing, and Christian values were the only way to save these children from depravity and poverty. Advertisements in newspapers at the time often announced the arrival of the trains and provided physical descriptions of the children, discussing their hair color, beauty, and age. Many of the accounts from these children, now adults, describe how they never felt integrated into their families. They always received different treatment from other family members. And even at school, they were subjected to ridicule by their peers for being trained kids. It was common for siblings to be separated, as it was unusual for the same family to want several children, in some cases. They never saw each other again, 
while others, more fortunate, stayed in touch because they were in the same area. The truth is that thanks to these testimonies, we can understand the situations these children experienced and comprehend that foster families acted for various reasons and not all children traveling on orphan trains found happy homes. Some suffered abuse, were treated as exploited laborers, and were never fully accepted. Only a few were able to enjoy a home that gave them the love and family they deserved. Their testimonies have been documented in books and interviews, recounting the unique and diverse situations of each of these children. Adoption was not a widespread practice for American orphans until after 1900, with the passage of several child protection laws and a gradual clarification of adoption policies and procedures. This period of massive child relocation ended in the 1920s, marking the beginning of organized foster care in the United States.